How are you? Welcome to the Entrepreneur Experiment Podcast with me, Gary Fox. Today, we have someone so famous, he's known only by his initials, DC, the VC. Donald Cahalan joins me today to uncover his entire story. You'll never have heard most of these stories before. He's one of the most famous names in the Irish startup ecosystem, and he's now a VC. We hear how he's turned from poacher to gamekeeper. Here's my chat with DC. DC, welcome to the VOD. It is fantastic to be here. <laughs> uh, as Brian Connor would say, DC the VC, to give you your full title. DC the VC, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. The whole DC thing is mad because it's how I distinguish whether I'm, like anybody who knows me prior to college, it's still Donal. Like they, and now at this stage, like I always say to people, like if, if I was walking across the road and a car was about to hit me, you shouted Donal, like it wouldn't register my brain. Like even my mum and dad, it's weird when your mum and dad are introducing you to somebody and they go, have you met DC? And you're like, that's not the name you gave me. Do people get confused now and they're like, what's the second name? Oh, and completely. Like, it's, Cause, in, cause I, it's in the, and I think I've, I've actually written that <laughs> DC Callan before and I'm like, that's weird though, because his first name's in the second name, yeah. and the second name's in the first name. And it all, it's a basic thing. Like it always, it comes down to when I started dealing with Americans, they <laughs> couldn't do Donald Cahalan. They used to do Donald Cahalan. First reaction was, that's not fucking happening. <laughs> so the big thing there was like, suddenly then it was about, oh, just call me DC. And then one day a, a set of business cards showed up and it was like DC Cahalan. And I was like, oh, I don't want to have to get them reprinted. And it kind of stuck. So like, the entirety of my career in tech and everything like that, like people have just called me DC. We've just solved one of the biggest, uh, yeah. biggest curiosities. Plus it was handy that DC.ie, the domain name was available, you know? Oh, so. that's key. That's <laughs> key, key when you're branding key anything. Yeah. If you've been listening for a while, you know Iconic Offices have been my partner for ages now. Working and recording out of their flexible workspaces has meant a huge deal to the success of this podcast. So it made perfect sense to partner up with them again for season 17 but to give you, my fellow entrepreneurs, a unique offer. Come work in the Iconic Office workspaces for free with no catches. Simply visit the link in the description below and enter Gary24 for a free day pass or a free day office pass. Enjoy. Are you an early stage founder solving problems in the food supply chain? The Green Man Group sees the value in your work and has launched the Growing Further Awards to back your vision. These awards are designed to promote startups that are driving sustainability and innovation in key areas of the food supply chain, including production, distribution and retail, built environment, and customer engagement. Enter at growingfurther.io for a shot at a share of the 100,000 euro cash prize and the chance to pitch your company to a crowd of industry leaders. Don't miss out. The deadline for entries is October 4th, with final judging and the awards set for January 2025. Learn more and apply at growingfurther.io. How the hell does everybody know you? Because it's very simple, as we all know, within 10 seconds of meeting somebody from Cork, they have to tell you they're from Cork, you know? So therefore... I'm glad you it, took the joke, it, not it, me. Yeah, it comes up quite a lot. I don't know. I mean, it, it's... I think it's over-exaggerated. Like, I... I it's the, not. In everybody the end, knows the, But it's in weird. the end of the day, we, we are... We are in Ireland an extreme, the entrepreneur community in Ireland is extremely tight. It is one of our absolute superpowers that, um, you know, you go to other cities, you go to other ecosystems around the world. And like, you know, you'll, you'll know, what I would say is you'll know the famous people. You'll know the people who had the huge exits and stuff like that. What I love about Ireland is, is that the, what I call the entrepreneurial infrastructure layer, the hubs, the, uh, you know, the VCs, like all the people who are, we call them the entrepreneur adjacent people, like we all know each other incredibly well. And there's a, there's a, I think, you know, it, it comes from government level down, you know, when you have an organization like Enterprise Ireland and the Leos, where you have a part of government whose sole job is to support entrepreneurs, you then connect in the various communities and all the hubs and all that sort of stuff. It means that like we have this kind of unique factor in Ireland of having a, a, an infrastructure layer around entrepreneurship. And in a country as small as Ireland, it's only going to be natural that, you know, people who, like me, who identify as ecosystem builders and want to see that infrastructure layer built out, it's only natural that we'll all, we'll all know each other and, and direct each other for help and all that sort of stuff. So I think that's fundamentally where that came from, you know? I mean, it's not, it's not, like I'm actually, you know, and it's a weird one because I know you've had other guests talk about this. Like I'm actually a massive introvert. Like I, like people think I'm an extrovert in some way. No, like I'm a, 
I'm I'm a real, real introvert, but actually I guess in some ways I sometimes I can overcome that. Some people said, like, is that what DC is? Is DC the character who's the who's the extrovert? It's not really. It's just like for me DC is your stage name. Like DC Sasha is my Fierce. stage name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sasha trademark. Fierce. Trademark. <laughs> Yeah, I trademark it, except that 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 whole comics industry thing would probably go to my disadvantage. I'm Donal at home, but when I go out yeah. the door, I'm DC. Exactly. I do remember Dylan Collins, you know, uh, myself. I think I think a lot of our initial friendship was based on the fact that we were chasing the internet usernames for DC <laughs> repeatedly, you know? You, you kind of said something really interesting that we're having a coffee, that the UK doesn't have the infrastructure we have. You yeah. talked about EI and the Leos there. Yeah. Obviously, the Leos are one of our main sponsors, but... The UK doesn't have that. I thought they did. Like I thought they had a great infrastructure. No, I think I, I think you know one of the one of the things that I find myself talking about an awful lot is that um, you know Irish entrepreneurs so passionate, you know, really great at starting businesses and stuff. But I think it's only when you when you get outside of Ireland, you kind of realize like you, the advantages that, that that we have in Ireland that you miss elsewhere. Like again. You know, people talk about the US, people talk about mainland Europe and stuff. I mean, you don't, like, people would be shocked and surprised. Like, if you took a, if you, you know, they, if you tried to go and start a business in the US, if you tried to start a business in the UK, if you tried to start a business in mainland Europe, like, you're, you're, you're very much almost on your own, right? You're not, you're not supported to the same degree as you would be here, you know? I mean, there's, there's, I think, I think a lot of people are under the misapprehension that, that there's an enterprise Ireland, that every country has an enterprise Ireland. Like, it absolutely doesn't. Enterprise Ireland is, from what I can tell, almost a unique entity globally. You have different countries will have economic development departments and stuff, but there's no other organisation that can say, you know, it's one of the leading venture investors in Europe and one of the the leading by volume venture investors in the world. I think we don't don't understand. Irish people don't understand because people always say to me, oh, you're going to run out of guests. I'm like... Ireland's one of the most entrepreneurial countries in the world. Oh yeah, people might call them. I'd say by that. like I, I know I've seen the statistics and and I never remember numbers, but like per capita, per head of capita, I reckon we must be right up there in terms of the number of entrepreneurs per whatever you know one of these great statistics per one thousand people. I bet you we're right up there because you do. I think I think even you know if you go outside of the the high tech entrepreneurship and all that sort of stuff. I mean, sure, you know, even down to the most basic businesses, like there, there are people starting businesses every single day of the week in Ireland. Look at your local town, the butcher, the you know, the publican. Yeah, you know, everybody is an entrepreneur. They I think there's a there's that. a. I think Irish people by their very nature. I, I don't. It's not probably quite self sufficiency, but I think in most Irish people, like you don't, they won't just sit back and wait for other people to, to kind of to do stuff. So like, I think you get a lot of people. They're they're not afraid of of starting businesses. You you find in places like the UK and stuff, there's a there's a you know there's I mean the joke in Ireland is obviously every parent wants their kids to be civil servants or bank managers, but actually I think we're well beyond the days now where I like so. you'd be kicked out of the house. You know what I mean for arriving home and saying, "Ma, Dad, I'm starting my own business." Um, but that's not the case. You know I mean it, like that's not the case elsewhere. You know and now there's we we'll call it. To, to coin a, f- a famous political phrase, a lot done more to do. But I do think that the starting position in any conversation about Ireland and how it, you know, and how it produces so many great entrepreneurs has to be a, an acknowledgement that, you know, government might not be doing everything right, but they're doing a hell of a lot more than, than a lot of governments, in particular at the early stages. I think a lot of the, a lot of the places where, we, where we'd love to see improvement in government is frankly as a result of the success, you know, where we're, we're actually getting very, very good at starting businesses. And then the challenge is, is when it gets to the kind of scaling phase and stuff, whereas other countries, they don't want to make that investment and commitment in the early stages. They only want, you know, they want to hit the companies when they're already successful, already creating jobs, mm. already producing tax. So that's it. That's quite a unique factor about Ireland. The scaling thing with Ireland, is that getting any better or are we always going to be hampered by our size? No, it, like the, I, I would say, honestly, Gary, the last two or three years, huge change. And and, and I think it's, it's only a huge change because it's become a recognised thing. Like I, I know from talking to people like Enterprise Ireland and talking to the Department of Enterprise and stuff, there's now a, a, they now understand the difference between startups and scale-ups. And I know, for instance, Enterprise Ireland have a very specific task force and a very specific mandate that's being set up 
very much around scaling. There's a lot of work going into, you know, how do we um, how do we come up with scaling finance for companies? And even Enterprise Ireland themselves, you know, have helped cross this cross the gap between the startup scaling phase, the startup and scaling phases by, you know, writing a few ch- a larger checks than they normally would. So I actually think, I actually think where, like a couple of years ago, th- the, the big complaint was, you know, the, almost the first acquisition coffer that any Irish company would get, they would take. And they were just like, that would be it, you know? So we weren't creating the businesses that were going to exit for, you know, multiple hundreds of millions and stuff like that. I, I now think, you know what I mean, you, you look at you look at companies that, whether, whether you want, look, I'm not going to get into the geography of whether Intercom is an Irish company or a UK, US company, and same with Stripe and all these sort of things. There's one, Stripe you know, is a Tipperary company, just so Stripe we'll, is, we'll go right back. Limerick That's versus Tipperary. Tipperary company, Limerick if we're going to play that game. Um, but the, the interesting thing is, I mean, you know, there's, as, I, as we all know, like there's the difference between what's on paper and what's, what's you know, yeah. in people's hearts. Like those mm-hmm. companies now, you know, even I think there was a great article a, few, a week or two ago in the paper that John Collison was involved in. Like everybody acknowledges now that companies like Stripe, Intercom, et cetera, would easily be built in Ireland today. And I mean, you, you look at, so? oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at the teamworks, you look, I mean, look, the Cork example, WorkVivo a company that six years ago didn't even exist and a company that a couple of weeks ago, you know, as we said, Zuckerberg was taken down by Cork, you know, not only, I mean, the work vivo story, what's amazing about it is, is I remember the early days of John and Joe. I remember them going and they were going to, their very, very first big contract, I think was, was against Workplace by Facebook. Mm, And, you know, I remember that story. they're a five person company. They're going up against Facebook and they win the contract. And like, did they ever think that five or six years later they'd be in a position where not only would they have essentially put Facebook's product out of business, but Facebook would be handing them, you know, 7 million users, you know? It's, it's, that's the difference now these days. Like, so what's changed? I think, I think uh, one of the things is finance. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've matured when it comes to the availability of not just venture capital, but other sources like private equity, venture debt, uh, the availability of international money in the Irish market has changed. Um, you gotta, you gotta give a little bit of credit to the pandemic because, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, the, the first re- international expansion for any Irish company was, you know, we need to set up an office in New York. You know, we need to we need to put people on the ground stateside. The very fact that that's not the same factor it was means that like you can now internationalize much much quicker because like we are operating in different time zones. And then as you get bigger, you know, I know the guys in Teamwork opened a big office in Denver a few years ago. So I think a lot of the a lot of the the maybe the mis misunderstandings we around, but a lot of the things that we thought was what were keeping us stuck on the island here. When when the pandemic forced us to think of things in a different way, we managed to find solutions mm. and find way through it. Um, uh, and in the case of Work Vivo, they managed to find an acquirer in Zoom also, you know. So, um, but I think that 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 has had a huge factor. I think we've also seen, like I, I saw over the last couple of years, um, when I was working in Dogpatch in Dublin, a lot of international venture capital funds kind of recognizing that there's good talent and good things coming out of Ireland. So that was that was a big factor. They're coming now. You you know, you get a lot of the London funds, a lot of other funds who visit regularly hmm. Dublin and, and Cork and stuff like that. The other thing then is honestly that we're actually also seeing the talent equation get solved. Like we tend to forget that, you know, we talk a lot about the the presence of the multinationals, the presence of the FDIs in Ireland. Uh, and sometimes people talk about them as a negative thing. Like the way I kind of look at it is as well, like if if we didn't have the Googles and the Metas and all those guys here, like you wouldn't, most startups would struggle to hire a product manager here, you know. Well, they wouldn't know what it is. Wasn't it, yeah, it wasn't a kind of a natural thing when we were all going to school that we were going to, you know, a skill set we were going to learn. I think what you're now seeing in the last 18 months in particular is um, there's still, there, it's still difficult, but you are seeing now people move from the multinationals into startups like we we invested uh, sure valley invested in a company called inspect.ai there last week and that's founded by you know an ex microsoft employee and ex- two two indian guys who came to ireland eight years ago became naturalized the irish citizens 
worked in the multinationals for the last six years, have now left and founded, you know, a, a, an, a, a, an Irish AI company. And actually, you know, their first two or three employees, one of them, I think, is ex-Amazon and stuff. So you're, you're seeing that happening now where the quality of Irish companies is strong enough that people are willing to leave the multinationals to be part of That's them. interesting, and I think that wasn't happening before. No, not at all. Um, and I think people are now kind of like going, yeah, I'm ready to jump. I think you made a couple of really interesting key points there about the maturity. Yeah. You have the work vivos, you have the cubic telecoms, you yeah. are having big liquidity events, and that stimulates the economy. And I think I always talk about you have to see it to be it. Yeah. You have to see the likes of Joe and John and kind of going, Jesus, that's possible from Cork. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to play a game. How many times Cork will be mentioned in this podcast? <laughs> to the nearest hundred, we'll get a prize. Yeah. Um, but that's really interesting because I think we were a young infrastructure like 10 years ago. I think oh, we were a young ecosystem because we didn't really have these things. And people had no choice. Yeah. If you're going to get a meeting with a VC, you're on a plane in San Francisco. Completely, completely. And actually, uh, I remember for years, you know, it used to happen so often, you know, that like you startups would prepare for weeks and weeks and weeks then they, they, they put their money together, they'd go to San Francisco for a week, and they do, you know, the famous Sand Hill Road, they 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 do 20 VC meetings in a week. And I remember, because I used to always tell the famous story of, you know, the great thing about it being, being somebody from Ireland going to do Sand Hill Road was that you had the secret mm -hmm. meeting slot. Because, oh, you know, you had, you had every country in the world people coming to San Francisco, trying to get meetings. And if you imagine, you know, let's let's do the maths, like a, a typical partner in a VC fund can do three meetings in the morning, couple, three meetings in the afternoon, you know? So you're competing for those six meeting slots. Irish people are the only ones who can say, listen, I know you're busy. Maybe we could meet you for a pint after work, All right? And every single time- And it's time, not inappropriate. And it's totally not <laughs> inappropate. But actually what see, I've, I've seen it so much, what actually happens is you end up in a bar in San Francisco or in downtown Palo Alto, and it's not just the VC, but he's brought like half the general parts of the fund because they're all like, I've never been for a pint of Guinness with an Irish person. And suddenly, you know, you're in, you're in like that space where every Irish person is so comfortable, which is like, you know, in a business meeting that has a social aspect yeah. to it. And it always worked. Now, these days, as I said, it it just, I mean, I hear, you still hear Irish startups going to the US and stuff, but it's it's never an exclusive thing now. Like right now, Europe is an incredible place to, to be trying to raise uh, money from venture. Um, America's actually getting much, much harder because they've had they've had a lot of knocks in the stock exchange and stuff. That's put a lot of, like the VCs in America, because they're primarily funded by pension funds and college endowments, are feeling the pressure from their from their part from their investors to like create returns, create liquidity and stuff. Ironically, in Europe, we've we've never actually managed. In, in particular, it's something I know it's been worked on in Ireland. We've actually never managed to get a lot of institutional capital, like pension funds and people like that, investing in VC. So therefore, while they're under pressure in America, they're not so much here. VC, uh, pension funds have become a big part of like the UK and, and France in particular have made huge drives now to try and get that. And actually in Ireland, I know it's on the agenda because as an example, like, and I think this is, this is where we'll see the next big evolution of, of, of kind of venture and innovation in Ireland is in France, the, when they introduce say the autumn enrollment for pension that's coming in Ireland, when you're asked, where do you want to see your, your pension money invested? one of the options that you can give, you're given five options. One of them is, would you like to see your pension contributions invested in young, innovative French startups? And then all that money goes into a pool, the pension funds pitch for it, oh, and then they cool. take that invest in VC. <clears throat> and like we've, I know the Irish Venture Capital Association and some other groups like Scale Ireland stuff, you know, have been encouraging the Minister for Finance, who's, who's been very active and very pro, and not just because he's a Cork man, but, um, He's been very active in looking at, like, yeah, is this how we could fund the next great generation of Irish companies by actually giving I the ordinary Irish people, like, a chance to kind of claim the upside of this stuff as well. How did you get involved in this whole game? How did you get started in this guess. madness? I blame Pat Phelan. Bring me right back. <laughs> I, blame, I blame Pat Phelan. Um, I blame Pat Phelan completely. Um, I've, I've, look, I've, my, my college background is computer science and economics. My first job out of college was in corporate event management. I I never thought I'd I never thought I'd get into tech. Um a lot of people know me from obviously my early marketing career. 
Like I've no marketing qualifications. The only thing I know about marketing is when I was working in events, um, it was my, my, my key, my main focus was launching stuff. So like I worked on the launch of Xbox. I launched the Four Seasons Hotel in Dublin. I launched the Western Hotel in Dublin. So I, I knew how to put stuff together to get that first initial kind of blast of attention and that sort of stuff. Um, Pat Phelan was 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 actually, you know, he'd founded Cubic Telecom, worked in a few years, was kind of, you know, wanted to leave and wanted to do wanted to do a new company, uh, which was Trust of. Um, met, I swear to God, I met him on a plane once going to London. And, uh, Did I, you know him? I didn't know. I knew him, the legend, like, of Pat Phelan in court. Oh, don't. If you listen to this. I know, yeah. yeah don't, don't go too far now. Yeah. Um, I, knew, I knew of him as a, as a cork techie person. Um, and actually, the greatest of ironies was that um, I was like, this is a guy now, like, you know, build my network. This is a guy now who'd be interesting to know. So I said to him, oh, are you, are you getting the train from Heathrow into central London? And he goes, I am. He says, I'm just going to have a cigarette first. So uh, I went out and I stood in the smoking uh, lounge outside of Heathrow, nearly dying of fucking smoke inhalation while talking to him. And he mentioned to me, you know, that, oh, he was looking at doing this new business. Uh, and I was just, I, I was giving my opinion on the brand and the name and the logo and all that sort of stuff. And it turned into a conversation over a couple of weeks, which was like him sending me logos and stuff. And then eventually it was just like, it just turned into one of these things where I was like, I'd love to do a startup. If I'm going to do a startup with anybody, this is the guy to do it with. Like, like I'll, it'll, it'll be a crash and burn situation. I, I, it was one of the early, I remember I met him when I was kind of just about to make my mind up. I met him at the Dublin Web Summit at that time. One of the last years it was in Dublin. Yeah. RIP, yeah. And um, I remember, I, I kind of decided actually in one sense to not do it, right? I was like, I'm going to have to go and get a grown-up job. Like, I, I can't be... What, you were in events at this stage? I was in, I was in events. I was, I, was actually, I was actually kind of freelancing, doing events and marketing and stuff down in Cork. And, and you um, wanted to start your own thing? I hadn't... Do you know what? I like The thing about it, I'll be honest with you at the time, and, and this is something I'm a big believer in, is like, like, entrepreneurship is all about risk. That's, you know, it's all about risk and reward. And at the time, I was definitely, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd kind of run my own marketing business and stuff, had a few knocks, the usual story, people not paying on time. I was, I was in that whole frame of mind of like, do I want to, do I want to go again on my own doing something or do I want to go and work with a bunch of people? And, and then in that, do I want to work with a bunch of people camp, it was like, do I want to work in a small company? Do I want to go and work in a big company? At the time, I was I was very friendly. Twitter was just getting set up in Ireland. It was quite friendly with people there. There was a kind of a, an offer of a job there and stuff. And I remember this this kind of like it is it is probably one of the days I'll always remember, which is I a day I had two meetings. I told Pat Phelan I'd meet him at the web summit for a cup of coffee and we'd have a chat about the startup thing. And also Stephen McIntyre, who is now a partner at Frontline Ventures, and he was the MD of Twitter in Ireland at the time. I told Stephen I'd meet him for a cup of coffee and we'd talk maybe about the opportunity of working at Twitter. And Stephen, Stephen said, oh, I'll meet, you're at the Web Summit, I'll meet you in the Four Seasons. So we were sitting in the Four Seasons having expensive scones and expensive coffee. And I was like, this guy's incredible. Like, I really want to work here, work in Twitter and all that. So I decided, like, I was going in to tell... You tasted the sweet... Oh, I tasted the sweet scone, scone in and the life. expensive coffee. I and was like, this. You know, this is an amazing company. I was a big, avid Twitter user. Yeah. I was like, this, this is the dream job. And I was like, I was heading off in to, uh, to betray my fellow Corkman, you know, and tell him, sorry, Pat, like, you know, the big boys, the big boys want me. And I came in and Pat was standing, you know, at an exhibition stand in, in an aisle. And while I was waiting to chat to him, like you just had all these like figures from the tech industry in Europe. I remember Michael Acton Smith, oh, yeah. the founder of Moshi Monsters, now now the founder of Cam. Um, he random. walked by, yeah. you know, Liam Casey. And they were all walking by and they were all stopping to talk to Pat. And I remember just being so amazed by the network that he had. I was like, what, what would be the harm of going to work with this guy for a year? Um, and I did for three years and, and that was it. Like, like honestly... That was, you know, working in trust. If working in, in what I always say was like the luckiest part of my career was I spent those three years with trust of very much VC back darling. At the time we raised the largest seed round in European history, which was laughable now. It was $3.2 million. Uh, you know, American VCs, UK VCs. 
got to go to South by Southwest, won the South by Southwest Accelerator Prize, got a trophy into our hands that had three names on it, Uber, Twitter, Trustive. No uh, now that trophy has 10 names on it and two of them are from Cork because there's a Cork company called Helix Works won it as well uh, in the first 10 years. Um, and then like after that Trustive journey, I got the experience of then going to work with the guy Peter and Dan in Teamwork, who mm. you well know. So actually my first, say, five years working in tech startups, I got the experience of a VC-backed business, the pros, the cons, and everything associated with it. And then I went directly into a completely bootstrapped business and saw the pros and the cons of that. And I think I think it was during that time and all that sort of stuff that I kind of realized, you know, there's there like it's important for founders and for startups to actually know all this sort of stuff. So you were getting your startup education. Yeah. And 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 I, that was, I mean, that was the time where I started, you know, I used to come to Dublin and hang out in Dogpatch, which was early. It was the early stage of the, of the Dublin startup scene. You know, it was the early days of Intercom was not not called Intercom yet. It was getting started. People like Eamon Leonard and stuff were, were you know, having their first exits and all this stuff. So you and think I, timing was right there. Is it the was, timing, timing like, was good. It was it was good because it it led to like I remember because I remember it was I left Teamwork in January 2016 with the plan of doing the the Cork Dog Patch. Basically, I had no name, I had no nothing, um, and I just thought like, sure, I leave in January. I'll, all I need to do is find a building and put a brand on it and all that sort of stuff. I thought I'd be up and running in May. I think we opened 13 months later, Republic of Work opened 13 months later. And the idea really was like, you know, we'll have a central hub for the ecosystem in Cork. Why? Um, why do you want to do that? Because why did I want to do that? I think I'm, I think I'm a naturally, I'm a very optimistic and I'm a very forward thinking person. Um, so I like, I like people to focus on the future. I like to see people you know, I'm I'm a bit of a people pleaser. Um, I like to see people get that get their shot, get their opportunity. And what I what I saw, what Patrick Walsh and the guys in Dog Patch in Dublin were building was they were bringing together a community of like minded people. This is you have to remember. This is before WhatsApp groups and contacts and newsletters and meetups and a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, and I saw that like what I I had started organizing like a monthly entrepreneur meetup in Cork called Built in Cork. We'd get 150 people together in, of all things, like the Kingsley Hotel, you know, in Cork. Like, not the most, you wouldn't think of it as the most entrepreneurial location. I'm telling you, there's been some business deals done in the lobby there over the years. You know, it's it's the Cork equivalent of the Westbury Hotel. Oh, right, you know? okay, yeah. Um, but, like, what I used to find amazing was, you know, we used to do these events on a Wednesday night, get 150 people in the door, and the energy was just absolutely electric. And the idea was like, imagine if you could, imagine if you could do that like 360 days a year. Mm. If you could actually put those people together. Like I'm, I remember at the time, so so that's what, like 10 years ago, 13 years ago now, was it? Um, I, rem- I was one of those people who said, who genuinely, utterly believed entrepreneurs were born. You know, they were born, you know, mandated by God to bring their product to the to the masses. You thought that then? Then didn't th- th- like like didn't think you could you could take somebody and train them to be an entrepreneur or anything like that. I think what's changed hugely in in my thinking over the years having been lucky enough to be exposed to so many of them is I think you can teach the skill set of entrepreneurship. You can teach here's how you do finance, here's how you do marketing and all that stuff. Um and I think we do that reasonably well in Ireland like I think the thing you can't really do is there's a there's a mindset around entrepreneurship. There's the relationship with risk and reward and you know, there's the mental game that it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. And I, I don't think you can teach that. I think you pick that up from exposure, like you by osmosis. You hang around with other entrepreneurs. Mm. You like frankly like if you look at, you know, five, six years ago, there was no Entrepreneur Experiment podcast. So anytime an entrepreneur was being interviewed in Ireland, they were being interviewed about the business. What were the results like? What yeah. was this? What was this? <clears throat> they didn't get the chance to talk as they do with you on the, what was going on in their head at the time. And I think that's, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the next big thing to solve in Ireland is, you know, because we have such great state supports in the Leos and Enterprise Ireland in terms of, and the universities as well do a really good job of teaching 
the skill set. Yeah. I think to get to be able to do entrepreneurship at scale in Ireland, it's about connecting that last piece of the dot, which is being intellectually honest with people about how hard entrepreneurship actually is mm. and that it isn't a career choice and it isn't, you know, I'm not like you can go to university and you can do your master's in entrepreneurship or whatever. I, you know, it doesn't prepare you for the hard knocks. It doesn't, you know, there is no, I'll be careful here now. There is no work life balance in entrepreneurship. Now, the difference is, is that does not mean you work 80 hours a week because an important part yeah. of being a successful entrepreneur is looking after your physical and mental health. Yeah, and, and, that's, a, and that's a big proponent you, on this pod. I try to get that across because yeah. there's so much horse shit on Instagram, all these hustle culture oh, bros. Hustle porn. And it's just nonsense. And you're yeah. like, the first, if someone tells me how many hours they've worked that week, yeah. I know they're full of shit. Yeah. Like I'll tell, I mean, I'll tell you because I know they won't mind. You know, if I look at the guys I know in Cork, like you look at guys like Pat Phelan, right? I remember when I worked with Pat and he will tell, he would admit a thing is like he, w he was always probably operating at 90% because he didn't look after, he didn't look after his health. He worked seven days a week and all that. Uh, the two best things that ever happened to Pat was one, when he started looking after his health and two, when the grandkids arrived and now Pat, you know, he, he will, he will power into five days a week and then he will recharge at the weekends. Like, there's a reason why you look at some of the most successful entrepreneurs in Ireland, and then you're also going, how are those guys working so hard? And yet then at the weekends, I see them doing like 100K cycles. Yeah, because like they're not mickeying around no. with 16 hour days. When they're working, they're working. Exactly. And they're working properly. And I do think like that's, you know, when I mean there's no work-life balance, I mean the reality is, is if you're trying to make that decision to do something for yourself, <clears throat> Entrepreneurship is not a nine to five job, but it is also not the culture that maybe existed 20 years ago. Exactly. Where it's, you know, you, you sacrificed your life, your family and all that sort of stuff. There is I think a, there was a yeah. lot of excuses there. I think a lot of that, there's an addiction. Yeah. There's an element of addiction to entrepreneurship that I've seen in so many entrepreneurs. They're addicted to, to it. Yeah. Being an entrepreneur. And a lot of it's voluntary. They're in this prison. Yes. But the door's open. That's such a good way of putting it. It is because it's... And you're like, oh, but why are you doing that? Oh, no, yeah. I, have, I have to. And you're like, yeah. but you're the one making the call, right? Yeah. Oh, but I have to. And you're like, do you though? Yeah. And you know yourself, like it is, I mean, it has become particularly obnoxious is probably the best word to use it in the last three or four years, you know, because you now, you know, between YouTube and TikTok and everything else, you know, I, I think a lot of younger entrepreneurs, again, like we're back to the whole thing of, you know, a lot of these people who were promoting the, the the kind of hustle culture and the hustle porn, the reality is, is like a lot of a lot of young entrepreneurs are not recognizing that they're they're the customer in this. Like, you know, yes, they're selling you like something. by the course, yeah. you know, by this, you know, that sort of stuff. The the challenge is, of course, a lot of the actual successful entrepreneurs, sadly, are too busy to be on TikTok and too busy. I mean, to be to be showing what the life is actually like, you know, um. I think, you know, I think back, like, that interview, like, one of my favourite interviews you've ever done, Gary, is the one with Ray Nolan, you know? So I call him Ireland's greediest man, you know? It's like, Ray, you've had enough <laughs> exits now. Leave some for the rest of us. But, I mean, did anybody go on that and, and was there thought, like, Ray has enough money now, he could retire? No, like, Ray loves, loves what he does. He builds yeah. and he keeps building. But it's, you know, and, and I think that, that there's there's so many good role models out there versus, you know, the Andrew Tates or, or other people of the world where, like, the reality is is what they are is they're kind of exploiting people's, that young enthusiasm to, like, build something. Well, you have a lot of energy. You, you have a lot you of energy can, and it needs need to be to, directed you somewhere. Days. No yeah. problem. You can do 16 hour days, no problem. Yeah. But then with age comes wisdom, you kind of go, well, now I've got a kid and now I've got, like, a partner. I, yeah. I actually want to do something else in my life. I want to get fit or I want to look after myself. You kind of go, uh, Elon... Has a lot of detractors, but, but when he was doing this, his Twitter meltdown, yeah. what he did say was like, when he was tearing it a strip off the, yeah. the Twitter CEO, and he goes, "What you ship this week?" Yeah, and I was like, "Dick way of saying it," but he's right in terms yeah. of what did you actually move forward yeah. as opposed to how long were you in the office this week? Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're there eighty hours and you've shipped and built nothing. What are you doing? And that guy, like that is, I think that's at the heart of entrepreneurship in general, right? Which is this idea of 
people talk about like people talk about speed, like build fast, fail fast, and all that stuff. I I've always hated that. Right? I always Same. love to talk about velocity, which is like speed and direction, because like there's no point in being fast if you're moving in the wrong direction. Um, and I do think like one of the that's one of the things where if we can if we can get better at velocity in Ireland interesting things will happen. Because I do think one of the challenges we have at the moment, when we have, you know, kind of a, a generous system of state supports and stuff like that, <clears throat> one of the challenges is, uh, you know, I look at, as I said, you look at the trust of Journey or, or any of the any of the kind of successful Irish companies of the past, even Work Vivo, you know, what they've been able to achieve in five, six years and stuff. You know, there is a danger sometimes with the level of support that we have around the place where, like, you know, you're two years in, and in your mind, you've been very productive. You've you've done a course. You've been part of an accelerator and stuff like that. But the challenge is, is like you know, have you like? I always think the first responsibility of any founder is to make decisions on the basis of what's the best thing for the business, not like kind of thinking about like, oh well, I'll do this and I'll I'll buy some time by going on this program, you know, like. The way I would describe it to most people is like one accelerator program is enough, you know. Um, we're lucky in Ireland we have we have multiple to choose from. I think, you know, when you see it in particular, as you look at something like NDRC, the National Startup Accelerator Program, when Dogpatch took it over, you know, the biggest change that you saw, like that program's been running for 15 years, the biggest change that you saw it is when Dogpatch went in and took it over, suddenly the people who were running NDRC were all ex-entrepreneurs, you know, they were bringing in the Rays, the Pats, you yeah. know, the Anya Kerrs, the the Amy Neils, like the successful entrepreneurs and people who knew what they were doing. And the main thing that they did was like they they drew they 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 drove the startups hard. Like they they got them to realize like that like every day is precious and every day moves on. And I think that's you know I was only over I was over with the NDRC gang this morning with uh, with Lorraine and Retta and Lizzie and them. And like that's the difference between that's what makes that program actually an international standard, which is it's not a college course. It's not a you go in and here's a bunch of workshops you do. It's very much about like yeah. the connections, the contacts they build. And then really again, like it's back to that mindset, mm -hmm. like here's Des Trainer, here's Bobby Healy, here's frankly, you know, all these guests that you've had on telling their stories, telling the real truth. And the idea here is like the lesson you have to learn is like, it's not move fast and break things, but it is move fast. Like I hate that phrase. Oh, it's You've summed it up lovely there. Oh. I'm I'm stealing that philosophy versus <laughs> speed. You'll hear that come out of my mouth yeah. and I'll claim as my own over the next couple there you of go, months. Yeah. It's brilliant. I hate that move fast and break things. It's bollocks, no. especially here in Ireland. Um, You've said a lot of great things there. And I think there's a lot of people cosplaying as entrepreneurs. There's a lot of people like I, I, updating I, I did their bio. I did something the other day and I remember I was like, oh yeah, I started doing it. I started just like booking off time in my diary for just doing office hours randomly for people. Oh, I because it's, yeah. Because it's valuable because it kind of lets me work, especially like in the, you know, when I left Dogpatch, like on a day-to-day -day basis when I was in Dogpatch, I was interacting with, with startups. Now, unfortunately, that I'm a, a dark arts practitioner. Oh, we're going to get to that. Becoming the evil VC. It's like, you know, instead of learning what's going on in the startup, every conversation starts with like, did you bring money with you? So I love doing the office hours and I love staying involved in the ecosystem so that I can kind of, you know, keep keep my uh, keep my skills fresh. But I do, um, I, I like, I do, uh, it's always changing. Like entrepreneurship is always, always, always changing. Um, and you do have to like, it's that, like I always think like, it's that agility actually which is what we need in the ecosystem, which is, and it, that's, that's where the challenge comes because the very nature of say governments and state supports is to be effective, not necessarily to be agile as their primary characteristic. So I think if we, what's, what's been happening to be fair is they've been getting more agile. I think the, the traditional startup supports have been getting more effective, you know, by kind of partnering up better. Um, and I, that's why I think, I think I like, I'm very optimistic, Gary, about the next kind of two years and stuff like that here in, in Ireland. I just think we could, I think all the pieces are there now. All we need is like the brave founders to kind of stick their heads up and go, is this a good idea? Like, well, you know. to rob a marketing phrase. Yeah. No, DC, you're backing brave. Backing brave. <laughs> How did you become an evil VC? Um... 
There's a there's the real answer and there's the marketing answer. I mean, the real answer is we, like we only want real answers. The real no answer is, don't I worry. mean, you know, I've been very very lucky to work with some incredible entrepreneurs. All right, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 you know, I, I've done my own businesses and stuff like that. At some point in the last few years, I was thinking like, what you know, what's next? Like, am I am I going to do another startup? The answer will be absolutely, of course, I will at some stage. Because again, as you pointed out, like I'm addicted. All right. Um, but I also was thinking about like what's the next step. Like I, I absolutely enjoyed dog patch. The, the travel was challenging coming up in Dublin, Dublin quite a lot. I was lucky a lot of my job was was kind of interacting with the other parts of the ecosystem, the hubs around Ireland and stuff. Um, and actually, I suppose it all was in the back of my head. There was this kind of thing where, okay, at some point in the next ten years, DC, you'll be fifty. And something will have to happen about the hoodies, you know, because I don't own a suit, but I own a lot of hoodies. Um, I see. I see. Like your gateway drug is just a jumper now. Oh yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is yeah. This, step, is, this is like down. yeah, but that's that's only because we're ordering New Shore Valley hoodies uh, soon. <laughs> when we're I just, see you in a Trilby hat, I'll know the full evolution has happened. That's it. Or, or bo- I've, been, a bowler I've hat. been seen recently in sports coats, and it doesn't work at all, at all, at all. <laughs> but the interesting thing was, like, genuinely, like as as a future career, I was trying to decide well what would make sense. Like when, when your whole life work and hobby has been around startups, there's only kind of two natural places you end up, which is you end up in like a kind of a university slash government job, you know, where you're just like supporting entrepreneurs and, and, you know, some great, great ones of those around. But for me, it was like, I don't know if that would be for me, you know, would be like a nine to five job around entrepreneurship probably wouldn't work for me. Um, and honestly, last year I was emceeing the stage at Devlin Tech Summit, the, the startup stage, which I love. Um, Barry Downs from Sure Valley Ventures showed up. He was talking on the stage. We had met a couple of times on, on previous occasions during his building Feed Henry down in Waterford and all that. And literally we just ended up having a conversation at the side of the stage. And actually, strangely enough, we were talking about Cork. Um, and... You know, I was talking about what was going on in Cork and stuff, and it it just turned into a conversation that basically ended up being there's there's a lot of potential in Cork. There's a lot of cool stuff being built there. It was a bit underserved, to be perfectly honest with you, by the venture capital market, in that you you kind of have Colonel Capital down there um, who do a bit, and at the time you had um, Sean O'Sullivan's SOSV are were, were like headquartered in Republic of Work, but obviously we're, we're more of a global fund. So there was just a kind of a natural thing. There's opportunities there. Um, like there should be a venture capital fund that actually is based in Cork as opposed to, you know, the kind of the visitors who come every couple of months, you know, to kind of see if anything is interesting. So, I mean, that, it was as basic as that. Like it was, it was like all good things happen. It was a conversation that happened. And, you know, once, once I started the conversation, I just realized, yeah, this was going to be a natural fit to me. Like, like it's a very, I was saying to you earlier, like it's a very different job than people think it is. It's the hardest job I've ever had. Uh, it's the most rewarding job I've ever had because it's, it's a whole, it's a whole new skill set for me. It takes advantage of the background in marketing and startups and growth and sales and all that. But also, like, I spend a lot of time working with our investors, which is the piece of the the puzzle that I think startups don't think a lot about, which is, like, you know, when, when DC writes you a check, it ain't DC's money. Like, that's somebody else's money. And in the same way that most startups spend a lot of time thinking about what their investors are going to think about stuff, we have to, as a, as a venture fund, we have to spend a lot of time thinking about what our investors want and how they want us to do and the deals they want us to write, you know? So it's, um, oh, I, like, I love it and I hope I do it until the day they put me in the ground. Um, it's a very different job. And I think one of the things that mm. I've I've definitely decided I have to do is, like, I'm going to have, you know, I, I kind of feel like I'm in this unique position. Everybody's joke when I got into it was, you know, um, poacher turned gamekeeper, you know? I think I'm going to be that gamekeeper who's totally okay with showing people where the holes in the fence are. Because I do think a lot of Irish startups that are looking to raise money, if they spent a little bit more time understanding the difference between angel money, venture money, you know, other sources of capital, if they actually understood the business model of venture capital, how it operates, why it operates, what what the limitations of it are, I do think they'd find it much, much easier to actually go out and raise the capital they want Give to do. Give me a two-minute 
idiot's guide to venture capital in Ireland. The two minutes idiot guide is that, you know, a venture capital fund starts by Gary Fox and DC getting together saying, do you know what would be great if the entrepreneur experiment had a VC fund? I'm liking it. Keep right. going. So we go, we decide then, okay, but what would we invest in? What sort of companies would we invest in? All right. And we come up with, well, based on your background, Gary, and my background, Gary, this is the sort of companies we should invest in. So then once we've decided, here's what we think, once we've decided what we're going to invest in, we put together a pitch deck. Some of this is going to sound very familiar to startups. And it says, actually, you know, Gary and DC's fund is going to go out and it is going to invest, you know, X money in 20 different companies over the next five years. And then we go out and we pitch investors and you pitch everybody from organizations like Enterprise Ireland, uh, the Irish Strategic Investment Fund, family offices, private individuals. As I said, in other countries, there would be pension funds and all that. And essentially you go and you collect a pool of money. And let's say we collect 10 million quid. So then, then the clock starts for us because what we're basically after doing is we're after telling a bunch of investors that Gary and DC are going to take 10 million of your money. We're going to invest it in a bunch of strategically smart decisions and in eight to 10 years, we're going to come back. And the deal is basically going to be that, like, we're going to give you three to five times your money back. So we're going to give you 30 to 50 million back. And of that 30 to 50 million, what we'll do is, uh, the first thing that happens is we'll give you your 10 million back. And then whatever the profit is on that fund, Gary and DC will keep 20% of that for themselves, right? So that's how venture works. And then it, every year we'll take like 1% or one, or 2% management fee on it, right? So the first big realization for me is VCs do not have a lot of day-to-day -day money. So every time that you're going to a VC going, hey, will you give us two grand for a bar tab for an event? We don't have a lot of day-to-day, -day, like if you're a first-time fund, you don't have a lot of day-to-day -day disposable income. So it's not, it's like the people working in venture are in it for the long term as well. So if you think about, like, if you think about that just as a startup, what does that mean? Well, it means for the first five years of our fund, we'll we'll write X checks, right? Um, and then for the last five years, we won't write any investments into new companies. We'll just write them into the companies we've already invested in. Right. How long does the fund last? Typically? Usually eight to ten years, kind of type, that sort of okay. thing, right? But if you think about that, just think about the pure logistics of it. If you know for a fact that Gary and DC just started their fund last year, that means that like we're still we're still kind of very comfortable in writing riskier checks because we're like should we wait nine years to make it up and see what happens? Whereas like if you come to us and we're in the fourth or fifth year, suddenly we're very focused on geez, we need to be getting returns now. So like mm. if you're a super early company and you're coming to us in year four or five. It's probably not a good fit. Yeah, you've written eight million. Yeah. you've two left. You, you see, in Ireland, in Ireland, you, like, and and this is a, it's a global thing. It's not an Irish thing. Like, like a lot of startups won't they won't think about that factor. They'll just you know they'll mail merge every VC and every investor that they can think of. Um, you know, mo also there's the fact that we'll have gone to our investors and we'll have said, hey, we think robotic podcasts is going to be a thing, so we're going to go out and we're going to invest in all the latest audio technologies and all the latest robotic technologies and that sort of stuff. Um, so that's what our investors are. They're giving us the money on the expectation that that's what we're going to back. Right. So therefore, if you're building, you know, the next Deliveroo for puppies, like, and you come to pitch the Gary and DC VC fund, like, you're not a fit. Well, you've wasted both your time. You've wasted kind of both our times. And again, like that would be, any, you know, it would be pretty easy to work out that Deliveroo for Puppies wasn't really in our in our thing. And I think the, it's that sort of stuff that startups waste a lot of their time by not understanding like, well, here, here, like, because it is, you know, I think a lot of startups and I see it every single day, they kind of, you know, they think of venture, like if you're an angel investor, you know, it's your money, you're spending it. So maybe, maybe you don't like, maybe you don't like delivery for puppies, but you can be convinced to like it. The option is there. Yeah. yeah. The difference is, is if you're a, if you're an institutional investor, like a fund manager, like I hate, I hate recognizing the fact that that's basically what I am right you're now. You're the man now. You've like I'm the, the man. man. Uh, I am the bank manager who can't give a mortgage to 
a person who has no job and wants to buy a two million pound house and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think of a lot of startups, if they thought more about who are who are the tar- every every VC fund has a thesis. Like in the case of Sure Valley, we since twenty seventeen we've only invested in really three things, which is. AI, cybersecurity, and immersive. Like, we exited our first generative AI company in 2018. So while everybody is on the AI bandwagon right now, like, we were at it in 2017. If you're not doing something in those spaces, like, it's a very tough... It's a very tough ask to come and pitch us. Yeah, we no. also, you know, we, we do be... Like, we do B2B. We, we fundamentally... Mm-hmm. Most of our stuff is, is enterprise-grade technology. Again, like... We've done a couple, like we we've, we've, we did Buy Me, Devin Hughes in the early days, which you'd say is like direct-to-consumer stuff. Um, but again, we probably realized we weren't, you know, that wasn't our sweet spot. So again, I think I think for a lot of startups, go pitch the, there's, there's now loads of investors out there. Pitch the ones who you're going to be able to have an intellectual conversation with on the basis of you, you're a good fit for them and they're a good fit for you. Was it hard for you to go from, like you said it there, gamekeeper yeah. to... Poetry to Gamekeeper, was it hard? Because, like, you're very much a startups guy. Yeah. You are a startups advocate. You're an ecosystem builder. Yeah. Was it hard then to switch over? I think it would have been very hard if I had got, tried to go to anybody except Sure Valley, right? The reason being, the short version, Sure Valley is, is, a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a VC from founded by founders. Like, Barry and Brian, who, who started Sure Valley, like, exited Feed Henry. You know, Barry then went on and ran the Walton Institute in in uh, in Waterford. You know, they're entrepreneurs. Like Br- Brian ran a big corporate finance house that he started in the UK. Right. So <clears throat> therefore, again, and 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 you know, you you'll see the marketing. Like every every VC in the world will tell you that you know they're founder first and founder friendly and all that. And I'm like, of course you are. That's like, it'd be like, it'd be like trying to you know. Tried to start a rugby team and kind of saying, oh, I'm not that into rugby, you know. A butcher doesn't sound The me. difference yeah. is, is like I, I've seen, you know, I've I, I've seen the walk, them walk the walk. Like like fundamentally, you could be you could have the best idea in the world. And if you were like a difficult individual to deal with, like Sure Valley wouldn't invest in you. Like we've we've found incredible founders, most of whom have had a very good idea, and we've we've backed them. But sometimes we've backed purely on the basis of the founders, I want and to from talk to that you about perspective, this. This that's why I, I found it easier. Yeah. Do you believe, and it might be a binary yeah. answer to the question? Do you believe you back the jockey or the horse? Oh, I, I absolutely the jockey, absolutely. Because actually, the horse you will change horses. You really will. Um, it 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 even reflects back to we probably when we're looking at an investment opportunity. We probably put a lot more emphasis on the problem being solved as opposed to the solution being looked at. Because I because I think the solution will change once you start interacting with the market and stuff. And I think fundamentally what you're looking for in a founder or a group of founders is people who are going to be intellectually honest with themselves about the fact that they're not just in love with the product and they're going to keep pushing the product and almost expect the entire market to pivot around them. I hate that. It's like my I, I, number I, one turn off when I'm completely. talking to someone. I'm like, stop pitching yeah. me. It's, it's a, I think it's, it's, I know, I know that um, like Ian Brown and the guys in NDRC, they talk about it being like coachable, right? Yes. And that's not, that that's not to be dismissive of like, like every, you know, mo- most good founders, they've incredible natural talent. But like the very best founders are the ones who are willing to take in a bunch of advice and a bunch of inputs, make the decision. Like no, nobody's suggesting that founders should be malleable. Like like honestly, any I think this is this is the sort of stuff that like bad TV, bad but bad but great TV, like Shark Tank and Dragons Den and all that tell you, you know. Like here's the thing, right? No VC wants to own fifty percent of your company. That's that's utter failure on their behalf if they get to that. They don't want to run your company. They don't they don't want to have the majority of the seats on the board. This is all the drama that's created by TV. But what they do want to do is like 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 I always I suppose I always had a huge amount of respect. You know, I look at the early interactions that I would have had with VCs here in Ireland. 
You know, I was looking at people like Brian Caulfield in Draper Esprit at the time. I was looking at people like Will Prendergast. Like, the smartest and most accomplished individuals I knew got into VC. So therefore, like, I just genuinely always thought, like, VCs are some of the smartest people out there in terms of they've seen it all, they've seen the advice. I think a lot of founders, maybe they 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 they, mm. they think that VCs want to get involved in the day-to-day running of the business. They don't. But what they do want to do is, because we see, like, you know, we have like 30 plus portfolio companies. So we see the same mistakes over and over again. All I want to do with any of my new portfolio companies is go, by the way, guys, that gang over there, they tried to do partner sales in America. Here's how they did it. I don't care how you do it. Like they, that is your call as a founder, but I do want you to be willing to listen to the idea, and maybe like in in our case, we 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 have a very strong network between our founders, mm. so we very routinely go. You're trying to do that; these guys did it. You know what? Hop on a call there and, and chill out. So I think that that idea of, as you said, that idea of coachable founders who are willing to listen, I think that's absolutely key, absolutely key to not just raising finance, but mm. um, <clears throat> but just to operating a successful business. What's your end goal, DC? What would you love? Uh, what do you characterize as success? Is, is this where we talk about cork independence? I'm going to try and make you, I'm going to go full heart, let's <laughs> try and make you cry, you know, trying to get some emotion out of here. What's your end goal? Um, Not in VC, just you, the person. A peaceful life. Uh, that's not an answer. It, it, well, what I'll tell you is that, like, honestly, I, I've, I've, I've made straight swords, right? I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a kind of a, contrary to what most people think, I'm a quiet guy, right? I love to read. Uh, I love watching TV. Don't get to do any of that stuff, really. Um, the the best thing that has happened to me in the last five years it was, to a certain degree, the pandemic. In the sense that the like, I I really enjoy working from home. I have a lovely office set up. I I find it very peaceful to go in and work there and stuff like that. Uh, I have my Labrador that I love taking for walks and stuff like that. I mean, like everybody, I mean, all everybody wants really is they want financial independence is, you know, they want that side of things to be looked after. I mean, what am I looking for in terms of like, what's going to, what's going to keep the soul happy, I guess is like, I genuinely, I I love startups. Like, and I want to see companies be successful. I think for me, one of the things that's going to make me happy is is um, I, I would love to see more stuff happening in Cork in the startup ecosystem. Uh, we've proven we can produce great companies, but they have been they they haven't been produced because of the environment we have in Cork. Like like nobody in Cork is going to take credit for the work of of John and Joe and Work Vivo. Take credit for the work that you know Peter and Dan and teamwork you know, Anya and all the girls and Riley, like all these amazing companies that have been built in Cork. Um, they've been they've been supported by the ecosystem, but not they're not outputs of the ecosystem. You know, a lot of these people built independently, they didn't engage with supports. <clears throat> so you're still gonna try them. scratch the sitch? I'm then. still gonna I'm still gonna scratch this. What itch. does that look like then? Um so so I suppose here's the we were talking a minute ago about problem solution statements, right? When I set up Republic of Work, it was because I thought the problem that needed solving in Cork was uh, bringing more people together in terms of um, in terms of having them work side by side, and Republic of Work achieved that to a certain degree. But again, it didn't fit. It didn't fix ecosystem kind of level problems. Like the interesting thing is, if you look at the US, if you look at the UK, if you look at other countries, like. I guess when I when I when I identify myself as an ecosystem builder, it's just like anything else. It's like being a civil engineer. There is a science to this stuff. Like you look at the most successful startup ecosystem in the world is Boulder, Colorado. You know, it's a city the same size as Cork. It has the highest per capita density of entrepreneurs of anywhere in the world. After San Fr- downtown San Francisco and Boston, it has the third highest per capita of angel investment anywhere in the world. Let's get specific then. Yeah. In Cork, what would you do? So the the Boulder, Colorado has a thing called the Boulder Thesis. It's essentially an actual academic thesis on how ecosystems should operate. Um, 
the first and primary uh, first and primary thing about ecosystems is ecosystems have to be led by entrepreneurs, right? They can't be led by state agencies. They can't be led by enthusiastic supporters. The reason being is entrepreneurship is all about massive agility and it's about, you know, at reacting to the market before the market even moves. So therefore, you can't have a successful startup ecosystem in terms of organization sports or anything like that if the people who are at the <coughs> top aren't actually working day to day in entrepreneurship. The second principle of the thing is that it takes a long time. It's not a two year project. It's the Boulder startup ecosystem took 10, 20 years to build. <coughs> so you need people who are willing to commit for long periods of time. The third thing is it has to be completely inclusive. Anybody who wants to get involved has to be welcomed in. You can't have, you know, Game of Thrones tripe relationships where this state agency or this university or this group or this people, you know, have to have ownership of something. Like an ecosystem is known by anybody, you know. We always equate it back to something like if you take if you if you if you contrasted entrepreneurship with rugby, right? Ireland was shit at rugby for many, many years until the IRFU got serious about it and came up with a strategy. And that strategy didn't start with, we're going to win games. That strategy started with, we're going to put the right structures in place, but actually it's going to be based on direct insights from players. It's not going to be based on, we're not going to ask the guys who commentate for RTE how we should build our global, how we should build our rugby academies. We're going to ask the guys who are kicking the balls around the place. And I think that's what, you know, the group of us in Ireland who are interested in building infrastructure for entrepreneurs, that's what we're interested in doing. Building the stuff that entrepreneurs have told us they need versus maybe, you know, kind of what um, what what people perceive is needed, you know. Like there is no real challenge with early stage finance in Ireland at the moment. If you're, if you're a good startup, and if you are in a the right place, the right position, and are able to pitch your startup in the right way, you should be able to get funded. There's a lot of people would say, oh, well, I can't get funded and stuff. And my answer would be, like, there's a bit of self-reflection then needed to be done. It's not, I'm not saying it's completely solved, but compared to five to ten years ago, it's we're in an infinitely different place with early stage funding. And as we've said earlier, the challenge now is, like, when you're, when you're successful, when you're doing the million a year in revenue, and now you're trying to get from a million to 10 million to 100 million, that's where the challenge has moved to, I think. Give me a couple of red flags. What do you avoid at all costs when looking for an, into an entrepreneur? Uh, we've said one already, which is somebody who's just interested in the sound of their own voice. Um, and, and, you know, they, they're looking, they're, they're thinking of venture finance as a bank loan. They think it's just like, oh, well, we just take the money now and we give them back the money and they're happy. No, like if you're, if you're getting involved in venture finance, you're going to talk to me three times a week. Like, uh, so you're looking for a business partner. That's, that's a big flag. Um, honestly, startups that, that, that don't, um, nobody, nobody's expecting every founder to be an accountant, right? But if you don't understand the basics of finance and the basics of cash flow, the stuff that twenty minutes on YouTube will teach you, you're you're a, you're you're there's a flag against you straight away. Like like when when somebody sends you a spreadsheet and you know it's it's the typical one when it looks like the leaving cert. Um, somebody asks you for a profit and loss account and you get something, you're like, bet you asked your your sixteen or seventeen year old sibling now to do that. Like that, that's that creates nervousness because because in the end of the day, what investors are looking for is is transparency and honesty. Get on the call and say, "Come here, I'm really terrible at finance, but actually, what I have is I have a really good accountant. They're going to help me." Or, "I'm really I'm really terrible at this, but actually, I'm doing a Leo course at the moment to kind of you know I want to know what what I don't know about this stuff." So that 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 I would say like that that intellectual honesty gets mm. you past. A whole bunch of stuff. The other, the other one is that whole thing that we mentioned earlier, which is like being too in love with your idea. Um, we all know, and it, it, like it's been repeated over and over and over again. So I hope nobody is hearing this for the first time. There's absolutely no value in an idea. So like, no, 
your your patents, your trademarks. Like, I know. And you no know, one abs- talk about it. Like, when no, someone won't tell me their idea, I'm no, like, no, I'm okay, I'm NDAs. good. NDAs. <laughs> VCs do not sign NDAs. Nope, because if we're, We looked at three and a half thousand companies in Sure Valley last year. Like, genuinely, it's, it's not because I want to be a, a, an asshole and not sign your NDA. It's just I'm not in a position to because I can't, like, all day. I can't tell you <coughs> whether we've looked at a company already that's similar to you and stuff. So I, I think, I think that whole, um, that, that, that sort of stuff is, is it again. It shows it, incredible naivety. It's, yeah. I had yeah. someone LinkedIn DM me a few months ago. I'd forgotten about this yeah. until you said that. <laughs> and, uh, he wanted me to sign an NDA to yeah. send over his ID. I'm like. Dude, I'm a fucking podcaster. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want me to sign an NDA for? <laughs> and, and also, why are you sending me this? Yeah, you get all these unrequested like yeah. inbounds every day. And you I'm like, you do see a subset. Um, you do see a subset of of people who you know they they do genuinely believe that they've just because they've got the idea. I think I've always actually one of the fu- one of the, one of the events that I've never run that I will definitely run at some stage. You know, been involved in running all these startup weekends and stuff over the years. The one that I've desperately always wanted to run is like put 10 teams in 10 rooms and give them all the same idea and have them oh, work on it for, like for 24 that. hours. I like because that. Because that's, that's the, te- like. That's the pow- actually hugely valuable. Yeah. The power is in execution. And, and you know, I always say that too. You know, when, when startups are talking about their pitch decks, I'm like, everything I want to know about a startup is in five slides. It's problem, solution, market, team. And like ask slash milestones, and what your what your team slide tells me is not like Gary's a podcaster, DC's a VC. Your team slide tells me about your ability to execute, or your you know here are the resources that we have to execute on, and then your milestone slide tells me here's what we're planning to execute on. Honestly, like those five slides, like I'll like we will write. Like I remember actually when we when we did the three point two million round for Trustif, Pat had eight slides in a in a PowerPoint and he had two pages in a Microsoft Excel sheet that VCs could go into and like change a number and it would make some changes and stuff. And like that was it. There was no business plan. There was no nothing. But it it showed a level of confidence. It showed now we had started with about 50 slides and eventually gotten to the eight that matters. I think people, you know, again like I think sometimes founders think that the pitch deck and all this stuff is it's kind of like they're filling in their mortgage application that's that's not what this what is should it sound this like? is i mean i can see easily see a situation where i would invest in a startup and they would have no pitch deck they would know anything but i would they would have such incredible confidence about what they're doing that like i would be mm. like these guys this is backable like yeah authenticity and, yeah. and like you say like you i know. also am utterly convinced that it, when that situation does happen it'll be a woman-led startup because the intellectual honesty that you get from women entrepreneurs when they come and pitch you is absolutely incredible that's interesting you know their their idea like the ideas are so well thought out the research is done the um they're, the great thing is they are getting they are getting the the little bit of like nobody cares about the showmanship of stuff. They are getting more um, ambitious. I was going to say enthusiastic ambition. That's what that's what VC investors want to see. They want to see ambition. Yeah. And there's a big difference between you know uh, ambition and exaggeration. I think traditionally the boys have been very good at exaggerating the outcomes, and then VCs take that as ambition. What's great with the current generation of women entrepreneurs is that you're seeing genuine ambition. And the, it's genuine ambition backed up by facts and backed up by numbers and stuff. And that's why, like, it's just, I just think I've had a few women entrepreneurs say that yeah. to me. They're like, you know, we've gone in and pitched and we've we've pitched the real story. Yeah. And then we've seen male entrepreneurs yeah. get backed with this absolute crock yeah. of horse shit. Yeah. <laughs> and they come out and they go, what? Yeah. Just because they told a fairy story, yeah. So that's really interesting. It's, it's but it is that it's honestly it's a difference between exaggerate. Like there's a there's a, a narrow line between exaggeration and ambition, and I do think like uh, we're very lucky actually that we're we're just getting you know we ha- we do have some amazing women entrepreneurs out there at the moment, and I think they're they're being very vocal about telling that story, encouraging other women to be more ambitious, like. You don't you don't have to say like oh well we're going to be in eighteen countries in three years, but also don't don't think like oh in two years time we'll still be in Cork like that that you know you can you can you can close your eyes and imagine if everything went right mm. where could you be, 
it is totally okay to like set your ambition based on that. You know, that's not being exaggerating. That's not bullshitting. That's not over exaggerating the impact for your investors. Again, like it's it's um it's a very different world, I think, for women entrepreneurs these days. There's still there's a lot of a long way to go, and there's been a you know I'm I I love that it's kind of top of the agenda um in in so many ways now in the media and all that sort of stuff. Um, because there's a, like, the reality is, is we said there a minute ago, there's no value in an idea. There's also the fact that a lot of the ideas in the world that are male centric have been kind of done and dusted and are used up. There's just so much market opportunity that you or me, Gary, will never understand Yeah, because we'll never understand. Kind of there's impacts. actually this one yeah. thing that's that causes, you know, massive inconveniences for women. And actually there's a, there's a bit there. There's like I reckon there's a hundred billion dollar ideas out there that you or me as men will never understand because it's and I'm not talking about the standard like women's health and all that sort of stuff. I'm just talking about how we go about life, life. and stuff. A like new that. lens, just a new, new lens, lens to look through. Very good way of putting it. We, we all look through the world in our own lens. Like you see things different yeah. than I will see it, than Ben will yeah. see it. I have we a red all, red cork lens on everything. Yeah, you know? that's that's mentioned <laughs> one thousand and seven. If you're playing along at home, um, you mentioned you yeah. you put up book recommendations every month. I've probably bought ten books off your recommendations oh, yeah. the last couple of years. You put up one three months ago. I'd say faster than normal. Yeah, explain that book to people. It's the book to change my life. It's the book to change my life. It's a big um, statement. You know, oh, I mean, I mean, it, it is like I will back it up and defend it to my hilt. Because I texted you and I was like, "Is this good?" And you were like, "Changed my life." Yeah. I went, bought it straight away. Yeah. I had it. I think the next. So, day. Um, <clears throat> about two and a bit years ago, I was uh, I I was self diagnosed first of all with ADHD, uh, and then also after that, then a medical. Pro- you know, the internet diagnosed me with ADHD, and then afterwards, a medical professional actually did the same thing. Um. And uh, a friend of mine that I spoke to, I spoke to a guy, a friend of mine in California, and he said, this guy in California, Pete Shankman, he's an ex-entrepreneur, so he's been where you, founded actually one of my favourite websites, which is Harrow, which is Help a Reporter Out. Mm. So this is, you know, this was, this was for those of us who worked in like startup marketing, this was just a site where- Such a great idea. Great idea, you know. Here's, here's, I'm a journalist, I'm looking for a story, I'm looking for this. Can you help me out? I could. St- I think that could still work again. Oh, I think I, there's new versions that, yeah. of that yeah. every day. Um, <clears throat> so, like, suddenly, you know, like, because because when you when you when you discover that ADHD is actually a real thing and that you have it, um, and why were you looking, DC? Because 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 I found um, I found that all these contrasts in my life. I found contrasts like I was an incredibly hard worker, and then there were times where I felt incredibly lazy because like I could spend days non-stop, no sleep on something if it was something I was interested in. If somebody asked me to do an end-of-month Google Analytics report, like, it it nearly, you know, I would nearly stick knives in my thighs before I would actually get it done. So would you avoid doing it? I would avoid doing it, yeah. So, so like, I, I went through probably 15 years of thinking, I had this weird dichotomy of, like, I'm a massive cr- procrastinator, but then sometimes I'm not. So you, of course, the challenge then is you go and read all the advice for being a procrastinator, <laughs> and none of it works for you. Yeah. So you're very confused. Yeah, and literally you try all the hacks. You try, try all, all the, the hacks, and they're like, things. okay, the hacks aren't working. What's <laughs> really? So obviously, they like yeah. this plays havoc with your mental health when you're trying to go through it all. And then suddenly one day, you know, <clears> you you start reading because obviously. Again, everybody, you know, there's all these people who are like, oh, ADHD isn't a real thing, it just showed up. I'm like, well, no, it's like everything else in life. It's always been around. It's just that at some point it become part of conversation. And, you know, in particular, like ADHD has been talked about for 20 years for kids. But adult ADHD, adult diagnosed ADHD, it's really probably five years. I'm sure if you went back and looked at Google five years ago, there was no searches mm. for it. Um, when you discover that you have, like, technically diagnosed ADHD, it is the most therapeutic thing that could ever happen to you. Because because in in the space of reading like one line in a document that says, you know, DC Callahan has been diagnosed with X, like in my case, it was like 30 odd years of beating myself up, 30 odd years of self-flagellation, of feeling like I was a procrastinator, feeling I was a, just vanishes overnight because suddenly the blame goes away. Because suddenly it goes from something that you're doing to yourself to something that, well, look, it, 
you know, this is a chemical imbalance in the brain. You know, it's it's very similar to things like depression. You know, I I, I know people, um, like the thing about depression is again, like it, it, you can think of it as a mental condition or you can think of it as a as a biology thing. And in the end of the day, people with ADHD, it's all about chemical balance in the brain. Um, and that's, you know, coming back to what we were saying earlier, it's about taking care of yourself. But when you discover, when you actually accept that, when I accept the fact that, well, like the difference between me, somebody who doesn't have ADHD, is just, it's a dopamine thing. I don't do it. I don't produce it the same way as other people do. And there's things I can now do to fix that. Um, that changes, you know, it changes your perspective. It it gives you a bit of a more positive because it, it, it shows you there's a, there's a solution. Um, and you mentioned then, like, like, as I said, the book faster than normal, I've read all the books on ADHD. The reason that that book is the one that I get to people first is because it's the one that puts the positive spin on it. Mm. It's the one that says it's a superpower. Like it is the it's ability also written in a very normal way. It's just some so books normal. are very inaccessible. Yeah. They're written by doctors. They're yes. written by, this is an entrepreneur <clears throat> telling the story of, okay, I now understand why I was always willing to kind of really accept risk and, and do that. It, you know, this is why I was always able to think faster, you know, do these things. Like, like some of the, the, you can totally understand while you're reading about ADHD, why so many entrepreneurs have it. I think every entrepreneur should, should read that book, I regardless so. of whether I, you I'd think you have it or not. Yeah. I think there's just so much value in it because so many of the traits I see in entrepreneurs and even in myself yeah. are in that book. Yeah. And you're kind of going, oh, yeah. That, that makes and it's, isn't it is like anything else it's it's back to that whole thing of like when you when you when you realize you're not the only one mm. that's like I always thought of that as as mental health and I think it's the same with physical health like you think about physical health people people are always feel better about it like you know when it's a group activity yeah. like you're yeah. in the gym on your own you're very focused if you're there with other people it 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 makes the whole thing more enjoyable. Huge. You work but, out harder. Yeah, it's more crack. You you yeah. re, you get more out of it. Your endorphins by the end of yeah. it are flying. But we it's, make but like we make <clears throat> mental health a solo sport, and actually in <laughs> That's particular, a really good insight. in particular, yeah. men like the the one thing that we have to be jealous of forever is that's why women are infinitely better at looking after their mental health because they they treat it like a team sport. Like you you will if if a woman sees one of her friends is down. Like they will collectively go and do something about that. Mm. Men, we're we're after getting so much better at it, but it's still you know it is still almost like an individual sport, not a team sport. It's as somebody said to me once, it's for men, it's still the hundred meter sprint. It's not the hurdles, you know, or it's not the the baton passing and stuff like that. And I I I think it, I'm thankful that we've gotten infinitely better. I think in Ireland in particular, like we've had so many amazing kind of male role models over the last, everybody from the rubber bandits to, to whoever come out and just mm. talk about stuff. Just um, normalize it. And th thanks for sharing it. that with me because yeah. it, it's conversations like that that I want to have. Yeah. I'm just normalizing in a very, in, a, in an environment like this yeah. where we're not sitting down and we're yeah. not doing 90 minutes in ADHD. Yeah. It's part of your story. It's yeah. part of who you are. And I think yeah. if we have more conversations around mental health, mental fitness, yeah. But as part of the whole picture, as part, what of, is, the, as part yeah. of the person, not just like, okay, DC, we're going to do 90 minutes now on your mental health. Yeah. It's very intimidating. That's very intense. And it's very hard to listen to. And you're like, Jesus, yeah. I can't, I can't go. Yeah. Like I've listened to a lot of podcasts like that. And you're like, Jesus, I can't do another no, one no. of them. And but I will, I will say one, talk about. completely. I will say one interesting thing about it. You know, you mentioned a lot of entrepreneurs have either have ADHD or have the tendencies or have yeah. the behaviors and stuff. The other thing that changes when you when you you know get diagnosed or when you recognize it is is that you suddenly and and I think that that book faster than normal is very good at getting you to understand that well like all it, what it does mean is there are some things that you will never be good at and there are some things that you'll be super at and I find you know I I I try to like I I've the last couple of jobs I've had since I've discovered the diagnosis I have structured how I work who I work with. Mm. I've always been completely transparent with anybody I work with that I have it because actually it makes everything easier. It makes everything better. And, you know, I know I know some, uh, a, a very successful entrepreneur recently that I've been talking to about it. And again, like he has structured his whole business. He recently raised money. He has now turned around. First thing he did was hire a chief of staff 
uh, who knows that he has ADHD so that he can organize around it, you know? Mm. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest part of that book. So yeah. we move on to a wrap for yeah. far around in a second because we've got to get you on that famous oh, yeah. Hogwarts Express to Cork at 6, 6 p.m. Yeah. Um, I think that's the big part of it is that he, sent, he gives all these tangible outcomes of like, okay, here's what you can do. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can structure this. Yeah. And it's so many like logical things. It's not like you have a diagnosis, off you go. Yeah. It's not like that. It's like, oh, you can maybe structure your day like this or maybe you can have... And you know what else is? It's not be apologetic. Going, absolutely. this is what I'm doing. Yep. And this is how I'm doing it. Um, right, quick fire round. Quick fire round. The famous quick fire round. What book? We talked a lot about books already, but what book would you recommend or books would you recommend every entrepreneur should read? Great book called The Messy Middle. Mm-hmm. Uh, so The Messy Middle basically covers the middle. doesn't talk about starting. It doesn't talk about ending. talks about all the day-to-day stuff. Uh, another book I really, really like is I like uh, a book that was recently rebranded. It used to be called Little Black Stretchy Pants. It's now called uh, Story of Lululemon. Because I think if, if you liked uh, things like Shoe Dog, the Nike story, you'll you'll like uh, that. And the best part is Chip Wilson, the founder of Lululemon, you can go onto his website, you can download the book and the audiobook completely for free. Oh, nice. Because he's like Canada's richest man or something. So Oh, nice. <laughs> yep. Okay. What's something you had to learn the hard way? I feel like that just comes back to the ADHD thing. I had to learn the hard way that if instead of, I, I think when you have a problem, you have to go diagnose it. And I, I don't mean, like, like don't just keep, what's the whole thing about insanity, you know? And doing the same thing. Doing the same thing, expecting results. something to change. I've become very aware of, like, when something is wrong, go and find out why it's wrong and go and fix it. Mm. That took me I'm going to say 35 years to work out. Yeah, I I, I definitely have been a procrastinator in the past. Yeah. But even from this doing this podcast, the best entrepreneurs I've met, they face problems head on. Yeah. Even the bad ones. Yeah. Just fucking get on with it and figure it out. What's something you had to sa- you sacrificed to achieve your success? Um, I don't know if it's sacrifice. It's kind of sacrifice. I wish, I wish I would love to spend, I would have loved in my 30s spend more time with my friends. Um, it's a characteristic of ADHD that you keep all your friends. Like I have friends who I haven't seen in two or three years. I still consider them like some of my best friends. I think I, I would have liked, I feel like now as as I'm getting into later years, would like to spend more time in, in my 20s and 30s, like literally just in the company of my friends. What's stopping you doing that now? Uh, now there's lots of other factors like families, kids, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, I think, you know, that like, like there's nothing stopping it from happening. Uh, it's just that it's more difficult. You know, it's, it's harder to kind of go, Hey, why don't we just all get in it? Why don't we all just get in a plane for two days and go to Vegas? You know, that like, I've never done that. That's my idea of hell. But you know, now, now that requires a committee and a WhatsApp group and, you know, multiple weeks of planning and all that sort of when stuff. When we ever, when we arrange, um, we have a group from home yeah. and lads trip and we try to do one a year and now we have to use a schedule or two. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Every, who's available what day. Their and dates blah, blah. and then the, the most votes. Yeah, and I think that's that's my point. It would, I would have, I like, I'm very lucky. I have close friends from literally age four right up to close college friends and all that stuff. I talk to them all the time. I just love to spend more physical time in mm. their company, I think. What would you do today if I give you 10 million euro? <laughs> Invest at Sure Value Ventures. No, um, if I got 10 million euros today, like obviously, like it's, I'd, go and, I'd go and solve what I perceive is the ecosystem challenge in, in, in Cork. Like I'd just do that. Like it, and it wouldn't take 10 million. It really wouldn't. I think um, if I think about like what would make me happy, I would just love, like I'd love Cork to be recognized for what it's amazingly good at. You know, we, we like it's, it's when you think about it, it's got Apple largest employer. It's got like, we have reality labs from Meta there and all this stuff. It just, Cork doesn't get the recognition that it should on the text. I was trying to think as we were chatting yeah. during this course, this pod, I was like, who is he reminding me of? Major Trump vibes off you. <laughs> Make Cork, Make Cork great, great again. again. <laughs> and it's like, we're going to build the wall no, around Cork. I will not be the first directly elected mayor in Cork. We, 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 we are very lucky to have an incredibly well-run uh, city. We just need, a, we, I think we need a city where we actually recognize our technology strength that we, and I don't think we do that as much as we should. Okay. Yeah. What's something your daily routine you wish you started sooner or something you want to start? 
Um, being more, being far more deliberate about when I when I eat sounds weird. Um, I now literally like have in my calendar like lunch, dinner, those sort of things. I was somebody who was like, oh, yeah, I should happen when it happens, and you know what happens. You you then book one o'clock meetings and stuff like that. Since I started doing that two years ago, huge effect on my energy levels and stuff like that. So I wish. I think my life would be very different if I had started doing that earlier. Interesting. The next question is one I've been looking forward to ask yeah. you. You can invest. I'm going to give you one million euro to invest oh. in one person and one company. Who is it? Do not sit in the fence. Oh, do not pick multiple people. No. Okay, a million quid into one person or one company. Yeah, this is a this is a, a kind of an easy one actually for me. Oh, okay. and it would be a cork person, of course. Um. One of my one of my one of my oldest and best friends, Jane Runain. <coughs> ah, uh, yes. Jane formerly had a company called Tallyvest. Formerly was Cook Connect again. Um, she, her dad, Dave, was my business partner in Republic of Work. Uh, Jane is one of the most driven entrepreneurs I've ever met. When she sold Tallyvest, she went into Blinkist, um, and now she's working on something in the uh, wellness space. I only saw it this week. I follow her yeah. on Instagram. She was on the pod uh, years and ago. And I'd back it all day long because honestly, if she told me she was working on nuclear fusion, I know she's going to get there. That's back in the jockey, not the horse. Isn't yeah, it? There's certain people yeah. you meet in your she's life. She's also got like great co-founder and it's a space that I think they deeply understand. So like whatever the business ends up being, they'll get there and they'll make a lot of money for a lot of people in it. Like Nice. People are now Googling. Yeah. Running. <laughs> you start a new company in the morning. What is it? Uh, it is something to do with entrepreneurial education. Um, <clears throat> there's a real problem online with the poor quality. There's no end of entrepreneurial education online. The quality level of it is shocking. Mm. I mean, you look at, I mean, you know, you and me being media nerds, we look at things like masterclass.com and the high quality of learning that you get from stuff like that. I hate the fact that a lot of entrepreneurs, like if you, if somebody says to me, oh, where do you go online to to learn about this, that, and the other thing? Like there isn't really a central place. You, you, you know, you, you go onto YouTube and you have people like Y Combinator Startup School and stuff like that. I just think there's something about, again, like going back to that whole thing of teaching the skill set, not the mindset. I think there's a I think there's a need for something in the whole entrepreneurial education space that that's quality driven and it's by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs, not by experts for entrepreneurs. What do you believe other people would find strange or strongly disagree with? What do I believe? I'll avoid the obvious core question. Um I believe I believe you can like I can, I believe you can build a big incredibly successful business without being like a big introverted character you know I don't like like for every Michael O'Leary for every Bobby Healy that's out there <clears throat> building businesses you know in in public um and driving hard and and doing some of the hardest things you can do there are like amazing businesses being built every day by people who are just quieter and, and sitting in the background. I, I don't think, like, I don't think you have to, I don't think your personality, I, we, we talked a lot about how hard it is to start a business and stuff. I don't think, a, I don't think a founder has to become their business. You know, I don't think the personalities have to merge and that like to have a successful business, you have to put your whole life out there in public, I, I don't think that has to happen. Damn, I've was, seen a lot. That's a very rational answer. Very was, rational I, answer. Yeah. I want conspiracy theories. <laughs> they go really well on TikTok. Yeah, right. What do you spend money on in your personal life that brings you immense happiness? Jesus, the obvious answer would be Apple dot com, but like maybe that's not the answer I should give. Honestly, um, it sounds weird, but food. Like I love to cook. Um, if you look at most of my Instagram account, I'm one of those sad people. Like every single item of food that's on my Instagram account, I cook myself. I find I find cooking really therapeutic. So like honestly, my idea of a dream day at the weekend is like stroll into the English market in Cork, buy quality stuff and go home and cook it. Like like that's like I'm I'm people I'm a gadget guy and all that sort of stuff. But if you're asking me like where where do I get the largest ratio of 
spend to satisfaction level, it's in cooking, hands down. So wholesome. Yeah. <laughs> What's your final piece of advice to every entrepreneur or aspiring entrepreneur listening? Uh, easiest one, the one I always give. Ireland has a superpower, and the superpower in Ireland is is connectivity. Um, every entrepreneur in Ireland has been through the ringer. Every successful entrepreneur has been through the ringer. Um, and they want to see people succeed. We, we're very lucky. We don't have a lot of assholes who actually are successful. So if you're starting something, like, reach out to people. Like, if you reach out to... Any single person that's ever appeared on on the entrepreneur experiment, I guarantee you, will take an email, will take a call, if you're respectful of their time. Exactly, Once like you sound. Yeah, like if you it, like don't 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 send them an email mm. saying, "Can I meet you for coffee?" Because that's too complicated. Thank you, DC. Send, too vague. Yeah, send them an email that says, "We're having a huge challenge with this, and I I saw that you solved it. Can I hop on a call for ten minutes with you and and Bingo. get your advice?" Bingo. Bingo. DC, that was phenomenal. Where can people learn more about you and Sure Valley? Uh, SureValleyVentures.com. Dave, I have a terrible website, dc.ie, but honestly, just drop me an email, me at dc.ie. Where are you most active on social? Uh, definitely, uh, my, 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 even though my, my brain doesn't belong to Elon Musk, my heart will always belong to Twitter, or will I have to start calling it X? I still can't get over that. Yeah. DC, thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Gary.